found fascinating the, among many other things that Professor Balu said, the suggestion that uh, somehow accepting this kind of shift could also change our perception, should actually impose a change in our perception of uh, Europe. And uh, also something that appeared both today, I mean this afternoon and also in the morning in some parallel sessions, was the relation between protest, the, uh, the reformation on one side and the Catholic tradition, like seeing the dialogue, I mean actually the dialectic between these two traditions, Christian traditions, relevant in order to understand the construction of Hinduism. My point is, it seems to me that in order to assert that there was no religion in India, we have to overemphasize the, the other side, that is to say that there was a lot of religion in Europe, if you allow me the expression. Um, which means, I've, I, have the, I have a sensation somehow that we are somehow forgetting some elements. The fact that, for instance, since we start, uh, I mean, uh, the discussion usually takes as the beginning, the 16th century. Uh, the fact that there is the Renaissance, that there is a, a there, somehow, there is of course a lot of debate, what is the Renaissance, religious, no religious, and so on, but definitely, there are trends of secular thought, whatever, I mean, however we want to qualify them. Definitely, uh, is Machiavelli Catholic? And, or is Machiavelli uninfluential? And then what about the libertines? What about the studies on, I don't know, the um, miscroyance of uh, Rabelais and so on? I mean, just to say that maybe we should be careful, so maybe we should also qualify the point on religion on the other side. Because I think that, of course, I understand the point, that what is the purpose? But there is a, maybe a risk of uh, emphasizing too much that side of the picture. It is not contradictory, simply I want to supplement something, that religion in the Western notion also has different levels. In the first level, <coughs> it is unending. Uh, just one remark I had uh, said to Mr. Balu, I made it common. One person in Ranchi, he was converted Christian. But after a few days, he went with a pig and a hen to make a sacrifice to his old lady. So father from church came rather, uh, just ran to him. What are you doing? I'm going to sacrifice the pig and the hen. Oh, but you are now Christian. Yes, I am Christian, but I have not left my dharma and jati. This is the position. I am Rajiv Ranjan, but somebody may ask that you are not son, how you are Rajiv Ranjan? Because it has been imposed over you. So in the same way, the, at first stage, religion is imposed. Then it goes to rituals, then thinking, and so different levels. So while thinking of religion, we, we should take into account the different levels of religion, especially in the context of India, whether it is a Western perspective or Indian perspective, but we will have to see the different levels of different thinking. Again, uh, you said um, the, we are, we are uh, including me, we are coming away from the Western concept of religion, their parameters, their uh, frameworks, and yet we need their support, we need their approval. For instance, you see the table, 90% <laughs> of uh, the intellectuals are, uh, the especially are Westerners themselves. So in that situation, uh, do you think that it is uh, easy or it is possible for us to have our own formulations and own frameworks? Uh, I, I personally, yes, of course, do also want to know what what is religion, but I am asking that question in English. We are having an international conference, and so I just feel that I, I apologize in the sense that we are not trying to say that you are not part of us. We are all doing this together. So I just uh, just want to say that, just personally. See, whether we like it or not, we are living in the 21st century, and for instance, English is increasingly becoming a medium of language not only to converse with non-Indians, but amongst Indians themselves. It has always been the case. Hindi never came down to the South, so just because Hindi movies did, did not, doesn't mean that Hindi came down to the South, it never did. So, whether we like it or not, English is the dominant language. So I think that any, any uh, purely pragmatically speaking, 
Any attempt at reconceptualizing, reformulating, redescribing the Indian reality will have to necessarily take place in English. And of course, we don't have words, but we coined them. What did natural sciences do? They coined words, didn't they? Charms, supposed to be the name of a basic particle. You know, sexy, did you know that? So they've got all kinds of very, you know, first the, they have developed cosmic laws of censorship to describe what happens to the black holes and so on. So, I mean, I'm just giving, those are not examples, but I'm saying so they, they, they coined words. So we have to coin new words, new meanings, give them new meanings. That's pragmatic reason. But there's a deeper reason, and it's more specific to the Indians. And it's an even more controversial statement when I say, uh, this explicates what I mean amongst other things, that we don't have access to our own experience. You see, a lot of Sanskrit words have made home in local languages as well. Chitta, buddhi, manas, anumana, avamana, abhimana, anubhava, and so on. But most of us, except for day-to-day -day languages, don't know what we are talking about. What is the difference between chitta and manas? What is the difference between, what, what does it mean to speak of chitta shuddhi and getting rid of manovikara? Unless you have done some serious study into Sanskrit text and guess, you do not know what it means. In other words, or when you say, I have atman, or Buddha says an atman, now, just because we are familiar with these words, we have no privileged access to their meanings. In all honesty, I believe most of us don't know what these terms mean today. So, in that sense, whether we like it or not, for pragmatic reasons, English is the language. Whether we like it or not, we have to, if we want to transmit our tradition to our children, we have to use principles, the 21st century languages. Natural languages and scientific languages, both. That's the first thing. So in that sense, there is no place for, and then in the process we discover, let's say, half of what has been told about tradition is not tenable. Well, we give it up. It's as simple as that. After all, we don't have God's revelation, do we? So what does it matter? You don't some, some ideas are not good, you just drop them behind. Anyway, that's what all the reformist movements in India want. So well, that's the first thing. Second, uh, Laurie's point is very right. It should also be done in the vernacular, and I'm doing it. I've been doing it for the last five years, uh, increasingly beginning to do that. In fact, one of the participants here has done a yeoman's job of translating heathen into Canada. I mean, those of you who read heathen should know how difficult it is, but he's done it. So uh, it's going to be published in Canada very soon. So yes, uh, it is there. But at the same time, we're also teaching, we hired an English gentleman to teach these Kuwampo students English. Because you need to know the language of the 21st century. You cannot get around that fact. And what you say in your vernacular must also be intelligible in cosmopolitan language. 